Welcome back to Education Matters. Did you correctly answer true? 42% of all public school teachers are prepared in one of the University of North Carolina schools of education. The next highest percentage is actually 24% from all other out-of-state colleges combined. We're going to continue our discussion of North Carolina's teacher pipeline with two higher education leaders. We have, first we have Dr. Anthony Graham. He is the Provost and Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs at Winston-Salem State University. Welcome. And Dr. Diana Leese, she is the Assistant Dean for Educator Preparation and Accreditation at UNC Chapel Hill School of Education. So welcome, thank you both. Well, you heard the, um, and I should point out that Dr. Graham also sits on the Pepsi Commission. So you are you are both um, working in, in this as well as uh, helping sort of you know, plot things forward. Well, you saw a little bit of the, um, you saw our first interview with, um, uh, with Dr. Fleming and Miller. This whole issue of sort of what our educator preparation program should look like in the standards. As someone, and I'm going to start with you, um, Dr. Graham, you were actually, um, you were at a and I believe, before Winston-Salem State, but so you're, you're certainly aware. What is sort of the, the, the view from the state's educator preparation programs about this notion of um, setting state standards and, and levels and things like that? Sort of what's your, your, your take on it? Certainly. Uh, the deans of educator preparation programs will tell you we're all about standards. We want to make sure that high quality, effective educators are what we're producing. Wanting to make sure that we're paying attention to content knowledge, content pedagogy, but also being attentive to diversity and how we respond to the needs of the learner, special education, and so forth. So the way we go about structuring curricula, the way we go about uh, developing partnerships that are authentic with our K-12 public schools, all of those things are critically important when you're thinking about what's the recipe for producing that effective, high-quality educator. Well, you, you, you touched on a couple things that I definitely wanted to ask you about, and one of those was the issue of, um, of diversity. So well, since you brought it up, I'll go ahead and, and I think that we've talked about on the show before, right now our, our current teaching workforce and it is largely unchanged over the last 20 years, mm -hmm. about 80% uh, white, 80% female, and teaching, at least in the public school system, a system that is uh, about 51% now students of color. Are there, I guess, what is Winston-Salem um, State doing? And then I'll ask you as well, Diane, how, sort of how do you go about thinking about talk, reaching out to those students um, who are either in high school now or maybe are entering college and then might want to go into a profession that would be a, a teacher of color? Sure, there are things we have to do differently. Uh, if you think about it, we began to introduce students to STEM careers in sixth grade. We began to introduce students to agriculture and business careers in sixth grade, as early as sixth grade. If you go to middle school and high school career fairs, very, very rarely do you see education as a profession that's being touted. Uh, so we have to begin to really orient and introduce students early to the education profession. The other thing that I think we need to pay attention to, I did a research study on this back in 2013, particularly asking high achieving black males who were 11th graders, do you see teaching as a viable career option? And overwhelmingly those students said no. And when we asked why, we thought we would find salary as the main driver. What we actually found was it had more to do with racial microaggressions. Mm. If you're an African American male student, for example, who's high achieving, you find yourself being one of the only in a classroom. And you look around the school and you don't see a lot of black male teachers. You look around your classroom, you don't see a lot of black males there. And you begin to worry, if I do this as a career, will I once again be one of the only? Mm -hmm. And then if I add to that these notions of salary and this oppressive environment, is this really the environment for me? So there are things that we have to pay attention to, not only salary-wise, but socio-cultural, yeah. psychosocial as well. All the whole, well, uh, Dr. Lee, that's, I mean, certainly um, something you've, I've seen you write and talk about the issue of professionalization of the teaching profession. Um, sort of how does that fit into this? Uh, I mean, Dr. Graham just kind of mentioned it about the idea of the overall atmosphere. How does sort of the professionalization of the teaching profession fit in? I think we need to find more ways to um, give opportunities for teachers to have growth in an education career. Today we're not preparing a teacher for a 30-year career in a classroom. We want to make sure that they have the best three years, five years, ten years in classroom and then give them the opportunities to grow within education into school leadership, counseling, higher ed perhaps. 
Um, so I think that's one way we can think about professionalizing education. I think all schools are, cha are facing challenges with recruiting diverse candidates to their program. So another thing that schools of education can do is to make sure that they're instilling a, just, a social justice mindset in their teacher preparation program. So even if we're not able to um, adequately reflect the public school populations, that our teachers that are going out into the schools um, are understanding school and community context, that they're focusing on building relationships with those communities. Right. So I think that's an important part of our curriculum that we need to make sure that is uh, deeply entrenched. Are you concerned about the balance between standards? I mean, look, if we're talking about standards, I mean, as a, as a EPP here in North Carolina, are you concerned about there being different standards for uh, programs that might come in? I mean, let's just say it, and compete uh, take away students or potential teaching candidates from uh, Winston-Salem State? Absolutely, that is a concern. We want to make sure that regardless of what the preparer is doing, that they're meeting the same standards. Uh, that's a concern of Pepsi. That's something that we look at and discuss and have been deliberating. So regardless of who you are, the standards shouldn't change. Uh, we want to make sure that we're producing the absolute best teacher to stand in front of our diverse students across the state of North Carolina. Right. Diane. Do we know how to evaluate a teacher coming out of a, uh, an EPP, whether they're going to be a good teacher or not? I think there's a lot of research around different ways of thinking about that. Um, I think a, one of the challenges is that we think that a test can do it. We already heard comments about licensure exams. I'm a big proponent of performance assessment. I think that that's a really wonderful way to gauge how well started a beginning teacher is going to be. Um, in the state of North Carolina, we have two options for that now. There's the Ed TPA and PPAT, and um, preparation programs have had that opportunity to choose. Um, and some of the data from those has been linked to um, outcomes in the field, both uh, teacher performance, or excuse me, teacher evaluations by principals and student achievement. So I think that's a much better indicator for us than a licensure test. Are there things that you're that are on your mind, Dr. Graham? That I, I don't, I hate to call them low-hanging fruit because none of this is easy. But do you think there are some things like I asked uh, Dr. Miller about, like you know they made the change on the test, or some things as a uh, you know, coming from higher that you would love to see if you could just make it happen? Are there some things you've thought about that would make things better for uh, the, the pipeline? Certainly. Uh, our partnerships with our P-12 schools is something I wish I could wave a wand mm -hmm. and really make that relationship more seamless. So what we're doing in higher education and our educator preparation programs mirrors what's happening in our P-12 schools and vice versa, uh, making sure that those relationships are much more strong, much more authentic. Uh, also giving mo more attention to this notion of performance-based assessments, making sure that we're providing that uh, quality feedback to candidates immediately based on the real world, what's happening in the K-12 classroom with students in front of them. So those are the types of things that are uh, low-hanging fruit for me. Another one is the Praxis Core examination. That's something that I personally have been interested in uh, for a long time. When you start looking at diversity in the teaching profession, the Praxis Core examination has actually been a barrier in terms of the number and percentage of students of color who are able to enter the teaching profession. Well, I mean, standardized testing, look, I mean, I think there's a lot of research. I mean, there, there are some issues with that. Look, we've been trying to eliminate high-stakes testing for students. Maybe we there's some of the mix for teachers. I mean, I like the idea of what you're talking about in terms of uh, really seeing a teacher in action mm -hmm. in, in the classroom. Is that what the, sort of the, the research, is that where it's heading? I hope so. I think that um, with uh, at UNC Chapel Hill, we use the Ed TPA. It is based off of the national board model. I think across the state of North Carolina, we are a leader in national board um, certified teachers. So if we can um, help to shine a light on that um, pathway from being a well-started beginning teacher based on your Ed TPA portfolio to looking at national boards, which also brings with it a professional salary bump here still in North Carolina, that's a pathway for teachers to have longevity in the classroom. Right. I want to go back to the, uh, the, the the relationship within the P-12s and the because uh, I've actually talked to your dean, uh, Dean Abdkalik at Chapel Hill about this. Part of it is just the time, right? I mean, there's a, to, to fit it into that sort of student teaching, is that uh, is that really the barrier, is just trying to fit it in? Uh, yeah, I think it is part of the barrier, the, the time commitment, because it does take time. You have to be intentional, you have to be deliberate, it has to be ongoing, it can't be happenstance, it has to be something that's kind of baked in, if you will. So there is a time commitment, but there also has to be a commitment to do the work. Right. Uh, you can create the time, but if you're sitting around talking and not actually executing, right. then you're not achieving anything. So there has to be this commitment to really want to do something differently. And that's what I see with the Pepsi Commission. That's what I'm seeing with the advisory group for the UNC system. There's a commitment from these educators, uh, Diana Lees, for example, 
who were saying, we want to see something differently, and we're willing to invest the time, dedicate the time, and execute something to make it look different. Well, I appreciate both of your dedication uh, to, to this effort. It's incredibly important in what you're doing, and thanks for coming on the show to talk about it. So we'll, we'll talk further as we move forward. After the break, this week's final word.